The next panel will be boosting supply during the monkeypox emergency, discussing strategies to increase access to Genios and other orthopox vaccines. Our presenters will be Dr. Rosalind Carter from CDC talking about U.S. vaccination strategies. She'll be here with us in the room. She'll be followed by Dr. Stephen Adams from ASPR uh, talking about the strategic national stockpile. And then Dr. Ashwin Bassan from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene from a city perspective. Uh, and he's the commissioner of health. And uh, with that, I'll give Dr. Carter the floor. Um, we'll start the panel. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity of presenting to this group. I'm Rosalind Carter. I'm the co-lead of the vaccine implementation team for monkeypox response at CDC. Next slide. This is just an outline of the topics that I'll be covering my presentation today. Next slide. So just for reference, uh, as of September 20th, globally, there have been 63,000 cases of monkeypox reported, uh, including 24,203 in the United States. Monkeypox cases have been re reported in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico. Next slide. CDC believes that making vaccines available is one of several important strategies to mitigate the spread of monkeypox and two vaccines are now being used for prevention of monkeypox disease. First is the Genios vaccine, which is the primary vaccine used in the current outbreak. And there's also ACAM 2000 vaccine, which is approved for immunization against smallpox for people determined to be at high risk and has also been made available for use against monkeypox in the current outbreak. Genios is licensed as a two-dose vaccine administered 28 days apart. And the standard regimen includes a subcutaneous route of administration with an injection volume of 0.5 mLs. And on August 9th, the US FDA issued an emergency use authorization for the emergency use of Genios at an intradermal injection of 0.1 mL for prevention of monkeypox in people 18 years and older at high risk and also for individuals who are less than 18 years of age using a subcutaneous injection. ACAM 2000 is a second generation vaccine for prevention of smallpox and can be used against monkeypox under an expanded access IND or investigational new drug mechanism requiring informed consent. Globally and in the United States, supply of Genios vaccine is currently limited but the U.S. has a large supply of ACAM 2000, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the next talk. Next slide. This slide highlights some of the key differences between these two vaccines. Uh, the ACAM 2000 is administered as a live vaccinia virus preparation inoculated into the skin by pricking the skin surface. And following a successful inoculation, there will be a lesion at the site of vaccination, or what we call a take. The virus growing at this site of lesion can be spread to other parts of the body and to even other individuals. People who receive the vaccine with ACAM 2000 must take precautions to prevent the spread of the vaccine virus. Uh, for these reasons, the vaccine is not recommended for persons uh, with immunodeficient conditions. In contrast, Genios is a third generation vaccine based on a live attenuated non-replicating orthopox virus, a modified vaccinia ankara. It does not uh, replicate efficiently in humans uh, and therefore uh, is, uh, is recommended for people with immunocompromising conditions. There's no risk for, again, spread to other parts of the body or spread from a person who's vaccinated to someone who's unvaccinated. Uh, to note, again, it's a two-dose vaccine, 28 days apart. It is not considered effective until 14 days following that second dose. Uh, I know you'll be hearing more about this tomorrow with the uh, safety talks, but as we know now, the safety profile for Geneos uh, is encouraging. There were a number of uh, adverse events, including myocarditis, reported in clinical trials for ACAM 2000. 
There's no data currently available on the clinical efficacy or effectiveness of either Janaeus or ACAM 2000 vaccines in the current outbreak, but studies are uh, actively underway to review these issues. Uh, in the clinical trials, ACAM 2000 uh, showed to be 85% effective against smallpox. But how well that transmits to the current outbreak uh, is unknown. So for all of these reasons, uh, Janaeus is considered the preferred vaccine for the current outbreak. Next slide. On June 28th, the federal government announced an enhanced nationwide strategy to vaccinate and protect people at risk for monkeypox, to prioritize the vaccine for areas with the highest number of cases, and to provide guidance to state, tribal, local, and territorial health officials to aid planning and response. Uh, HHS, including sister agencies, ASPR, CDC, FDA, worked closely with partners to ensure enough vaccine doses were available to vaccinate all the people for whom vaccine was recommended. And in this next slide, I'm gonna talk about those recommendations. Next slide. So the primary vaccination strategy has been focused on post-exposure prophylaxis. And this strategy has been rolled out in a few different phases. So the, in phase one in June of 2022, and actually beginning in May, uh, vaccine was distributed to jurisdictions using a tiered allocation system based on case rates. And it was primarily focused on people who had close contact with someone known to have monkeypox. These cases were identified through case investigation, contact tracing, and risk exposure assessment. Um, what we've learned from uh, many of the jurisdictions doing this contact tracing is that a substantial number of people diagnosed with monkeypox reported anonymous contacts or they identified contacts who couldn't be identified for contact monitoring. As a result, the strategy was revised to include expanded post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP++, uh, and this was rolled out in July of this year with additional vaccine distributed to continue to support, again, known contacts, uh, known exposures, uh, along with this expanded PEP++. And who's included in PEP++? These are people with recent uh, sex partners identified uh, in the past 14 days who were diagnosed with monkeypox. So again, relying on someone coming forward, self-identifying as having been a contact. Um, in addition, gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, transgender and gender diverse people who have sex with men, uh, who had any of the following within the past 14 days were also part of this PEP++ group. So that includes sex with multiple partners, sex at commercial sex venues, and sex in association with events, venues, or in a defined geographic area where monkeypox transmission is occurring. Again, all the focus was on people who are at a much higher risk of exposure to monkeypox, although uh, we, monkeypox did not have to be uh, identified in one of their sex partners. And finally, U.S. strategies have all, always supported PrEP where it's feasible given the current supplies of vaccine. And we recommend that jurisdictions who are implementing a PrEP approach should decide on which populations to focus their efforts on based on the potential for exposure to monkeypox, the local epidemiology, population needs, and again, feasibility given limited supplies. CDC is not recommending routine pre-exposure prophylaxis for the general public. That's because available data from the current outbreak indicate that specific populations are being impacted and therefore our vaccine efforts need to be focused. Guidance from ACIP that predates this current uh, monkeypox outbreak had always recommended PrEP and still recommends PrEP for research lab personnel working with orthopox viruses clinical laboratory personnel performing diagnostic testing for orthopox viruses, and healthcare worker response teams um, for appropriate public health agencies. Next slide. We recommend that all of these vaccine strategies should be applied using health equity principles as a 
Foundation, and a number of these principles are listed on the slide, but in particularly highlighting the need to work with uh, and engage diverse partners who work with special populations uh, to improve accessibility, to improve the hours that clinics are open, all the things that we learned during COVID-19 um, to bring the vaccine as close to the affected population as possible. Next slide. So let me just orient you to this slide. This is a timeline on the top for the introduction of PEP and PEP++ strategies. And on the bottom, that's the monkeypox, monkeypox case count. Um, this is a fairly complex slide, so I wasn't able to update this through today, but through uh, the first week of September, just shows, showing the case counts. And what we see is, again, uh, the first U.S. case identified May 18th, the first uh, dose of vaccine delivered to New York City on May 22nd, and then continuing for the month of June and into beginning of July was this PEP strategy, again, focused on contacts of known monkeypox cases, which uh, worked well when the case rates were quite low. As cases began to pick up, uh, it was clear that an expanded strategy was needed, and that's where PEP++ plus plus was introduced. And then finally, on the most right-hand part, uh, we note the introduction of the FDA EUA, allowing the intradermal um, route of administration for the Geneos vaccine, which allowed us to get uh, between three to five uh, doses out of a, what was originally a single dose vial for subcutaneous administration, uh, which really greatly increased uh, the number of vaccine doses that were available. Next slide. So this graph shows the total uh, number of vaccines administered and reported from jurisdictions to CDC, which is currently 48 out of our 60, uh, 62 jurisdictions. Uh, and this is through uh, yesterday and just updated last night on CDC websites. The second, uh, sorry, the first doses are in the dark blue, second doses in light blue. And as you can see, almost 685,000 vaccine doses have been administered to the, in jurisdictions providing data. Now, this is actually an underestimate because it doesn't include, again, jurisdictions that are just coming on board with reporting, as well as all the vaccines that have been distributed through our federal entities, which includes the Indian Health Service, the VA system, Department of Defense, Department of State, uh, and Bureau of Prisons. Uh, I just also want to point out, as you can see, the increase in second doses that uh, initially, again, with limited supply, many of our jurisdictions made the decision to focus on administering as many first doses as possible uh, and delaying second doses until they felt supply uh, uh, was able to support that. And that's what we're seeing again in this graph. Next slide. So looking at this at a national level, uh, again, these are the 48 jurisdictions reporting. Uh, you can see the highest number of administrations are in our highest burden states like California, Florida, uh, New York City, Texas. Uh, I just point out also that in the lighter colors where we have fewer administrations, this also in part reflects uh, getting smaller allocations to these uh, states which have a lower number of cases. So it does not reflect uh, coverage. I think this just gives you a general idea of where highest rates of vaccination are occurring, or high, sorry, highest number of vaccine administrations are occurring. Uh, next slide. Before concluding, I just wanted to mention that in addition to our current vaccine strategy, again, states have uh, a set allocation based on uh, their populations at risk as well as uh, monkeypox case counts, but additional allocations have been made available to support large events uh, defined as more than 50,000 attendees that bring together a large number of vaccine eligible populations. So many of these are centered around uh, large gay pride events in everywhere from Atlanta to uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and including uh, Boise, Idaho to reach uh, rural populations for gay pride events. And then on September 15th, the White House announced a new pilot program 
to support populations at elevated risk of monkeypox, but the, uh, who may face barriers in getting vaccine. And again, the main purpose of this new project is to uh, increase vaccine equity through working with community-based organizations, local health departments, uh, and the state health departments. So we've already received applications for those uh, smaller events for health, equ health equity. We really look forward to uh, seeing what can happen on the most local level. Um, in conclusion, I also just want to recognize and thank uh, everyone working at the immunization program level in cities, states, and our territories, as well as our federal partners who really the boots on the ground and standing up a successful vaccine program in record speed with limited resources, really uh, showing us how well emergency response can be done um, and have accomplished so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, our next presenter will be Stephen Adams from the Assistant Secretary for uh, Prevention and Response, uh, speaking about st strategic national stockpile. He's on the, the call. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me? You're loud and clear. Very good. Uh, first off, my apologies that I was not able to join you in the Great Hall, uh, and I'm appreciative that you're able to accommodate uh, the presentation remotely. Um, I, I, I have two background slides and then I'll uh, uh, move through quickly and then uh, we'll talk about our support of the monkeypox response. First, um, we are now the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. Um, the priorities um, as laid out by our ASPR uh, extend the capabilities to respond well uh, and emerge from COVID more capable than we were when we went into it, restore resources and capabilities that were diminished or expended as part of the response to COVID, and prepare for the future, prepare for the unknown, whether it's man-made or, or natural, to assure that we're positioned moving ahead to meet needs. Slide, please. Um, just a, a brief bit of background on the strategic national stockpile for those that are not familiar with it. We have been in existence since 99. Uh, we presently maintain a portfolio of about $13 billion worth of medical material. Um, at high level, um, antibiotics, antitoxins, antidotes, antiviral drugs, certainly, of course, vaccines and uh, in the wake of uh, the initial days of COVID and with support from Congress, we've added substantial capabilities uh, for personal protective gear and uh, greatly expanded our capacities uh, to support mechanical ventilation um, with all of the ancillaries. Um, so the, the substantial growth for the program as a result. Slide, please. Shifting to the monkeypox outbreak. Um, we activated to support uh, the growing efforts, um, actually prior to the first domestic cases uh, in May of 22. Um, and we've supported uh, the growing and expanding effort since. Um, we've deployed uh, a great deal of material, vaccines, therapeutics, nationwide um, to state jurisdictions, to large cities, uh, that have been impacted. Um, the numbers for what we've deployed as of a couple of days ago are here. I, I would like to take uh, a moment though to point out that we have these tools in the toolbox uh, only as a result of many investments made over the years uh, by our colleagues in our sister organization, uh, BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, and investments by the Strategic National Stockpile uh, both to address smallpox preparedness. So Genios vaccine and uh, uh, Ticoviramat would not exist had uh, Congress not funded it and VARDA not made the initial investments uh, to develop both the vaccine and uh, the therapeutic. So because of those prior investments in, in preparedness, we had the tools in the toolbox at the onset of monkeypox. And fortunately, um, they were uh, they were useful and, and effective. So we have uh, deployed more than 800,000 vials of the Genios. Um, 
eight vials, if you will. There was one jurisdiction that made an early request for ACAM, um, but uh, I think thankfully ACAM has not been a part of the response. And at this stage, barring some dramatic change, we don't anticipate it will be. Uh, and uh, also uh, a fairly substantial quantity of the oral ticoviramat, and although I don't have the, the particular counts here, uh, an additional quantity of the IV uh, ticoviramat. Slide, please. Um, actually, I, I think we can skip this slide in the interest of time and this one, uh, as Dr. Carter, I think, has covered quite nicely. Um, we uh, had a number of meetings with both the, uh, the jurisdiction representatives, in particular uh, association, the immunization directors, and we had a very clear understanding from the beginning that some of the limitations of our existing distribution methodology to address um, the uh, genios and TPOX were really creating challenges um, for our state and large city partners who simply lacked infrastructure to move physical product to all of the areas within states where there were populations at risk. Um, we, we understood this was a challenge. We were actually challenged ourselves with being able to uh, identify the resources to be able to create uh, a more flexible set of capabilities to better support the realities that were presented to us all by monkeypox. Um, we were fortunate at being able to uh, partner with our colleagues at Amerisource Bergen and uh, have uh, this week brought online uh, contracts that are now supporting uh, 2,500 uh, shipments uh, per week for the Genios uh, and another 2,500 as needed for the ambient product, the, the TPOX. Um, the, following the, the same model of allocation for the vaccine itself, which was proportional to um, uh, cases and uh, at-risk population, um, essentially we've done a virtual allocation of the 2,500 shipment capabilities so that we match up with the vaccine to give the jurisdictions uh, as much flexibility as we can at being able to support their needs to move this product forward and minimize the necessity for uh, state or other jurisdictions to actually physically handle the product. Uh, some states have elected to continue to do so where they have robust internal capability, which is great, but we're wanting to assure that all have the flexibility to use these tools as needed moving ahead. Um, we really think that this was, and the, the argument for this was made very eloquently by a number of the state immunization directors that this wasn't simply a, an issue of convenience for the states or a challenge of having to do something hard, but it really was an equity issue where in many of the jurisdictions, they simply, um, state immunization programs simply no longer are in the day-to-day -day business of moving vaccine. Uh, and they simply didn't have the infrastructure in place to be able to move product all over the state, um, particularly to the smaller areas um, with lower population levels, but nonetheless, uh, population at risk who otherwise were not having access to care. So this was a, a, certainly a priority for us, uh, certainly a priority for um, Assistant Secretary, um, uh, the R. Asper and my boss, who gave us the go ahead to, uh, despite the uh, challenges with resource, resources to put this capability in place um, now. So slide please. Uh, a couple other uh, areas to highlight on, and again, Dr. Carter um, had talked about support to um, the, the large pride events, uh, which I think has been successful, as well as the follow on uh, smaller events, uh, equity events many are uh, discussing. We've also um, uh, continued to support uh, in collaboration with the CDC clinical team, uh, smaller scale shipments of the IV TPOX, uh, as well as uh, a very modest uh, level of shipments of the vaccine immune globulin IV um, in cases where it is uh, warranted uh, for patients who, uh, uh, for whom we're not seeing success with uh, the antivirals. Um, 
We are continuing to uh, make the ACAM 2000 available if it is needed, but uh, again, the only shipments to date were to one jurisdiction very early on. And of course, we continue to collaborate uh, on an ongoing basis with our colleagues at CDC and FDA. And uh, more than anything, this is all around communication and just assuring that all have a shared view of what the regulatory requirements are um, uh, and assure that they are followed. Uh, slide, please. Um, this is a bit of a, the, the slide itself is a bit of a misnomer. We're, we're actually um, not buying additional vaccine doses as uh, the U.S. government uh, has already owned bulk product, uh, but our colleagues at uh, BARDA uh, are working to have uh, a, a store of bulk product that uh, they have owned that has been held by, by Bavaria Nordic processed into uh, additional patient ready doses. And that effort is ongoing and we will see a, a increasing stream of, of vaccine uh, moving into the United States and available for use. Um, I will say that we are also, uh, thankfully at, at least if, with some seeing some, um, some inspiring directions and, uh, and hoping that there is a, at least a light at the end of the tunnel uh, for the monkeypox response. We're beginning to at least look at some of the strategies for long-term storage of vaccine um, for the eventual time that we um, shift back toward a preparedness effort for smallpox with uh, these tools um, once uh, monkeypox needs are met. Um, and slide again, I believe is my final and subject to questions, um, that that is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next presenter is Commissioner Ashwin Vassan from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, Dr. Vassan, your slides are up. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you here today and to offer a local perspective, um, a local public health perspective around uh, the monkeypox uh, vaccination effort that we've mounted here in New York City. I'm Ashwin Vasan. I'm the Commissioner of Health of the City of New York, and it's my great honor to be with you here today on behalf of my colleagues and my team. Uh, next slide, please. So let's review the monkeypox vaccination campaign to date here in New York City. Next slide. Let's start with cases, and this reflects what we're seeing across the country we've seen a significant and steep decline uh, in cases. At one point uh, in the uh, monkeypox outbreak, the monkeypox epidemic, we represented uh, above 30% of all the national cases. So we were the epicenter and we reached a peak of nearly 75 cases, new cases diagnosed in a day. And that was in early August. But since that time, um, we have certainly seen a steep decline in um, case rates driven, I think, as we've seen in the national experience, by two phenomena. One is incredible engagement, advocacy, um, dissemination of information and behavior change from the affected community. Men who have sex with men, LGBTQ and trans people have really taken the charge up, in, you know, and really building off of their history of engagement in health and human rights and made the necessary behavior changes to um, prevent transmission of monkeypox. And two, a pretty incredible and speedy mounting of a vaccination effort by our health department in partnership with all of you and with partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, for which we are um, deeply grateful. So next slide. As you will know, New York City was the first jurisdiction in the country to launch the extended PEP vaccination clinics on June 23rd. We did that deliberately because we knew we needed to get ahead of what we anticipated would be really um, dramatic rises in transmission with the opening up of social networks, sexual networks, not just in and around Pride Month in June, um, but in the subsequent weeks and months into July and August. Um, so we did open up 
that criteria, we'll open up that clinic um, in June. And as previously described by Dr. Carter, the eligibility has been people with multiple or anonymous uh, sex partners in the last 14 days and that identify as one of the following, gay, bisexual, or other man who has sex with men, or a transgender woman, transgender or gender non-conforming or gender non-binary person, or sex workers. More recently, we've expanded, expanded our eligibility to include sex workers. Now, one may say, and as Dr. Carter recognized, this requires the self-disclosure and self-report of sexual behavior in the last two weeks at a time when we've seen dramatic shifts in sexual behavior. And so we were mindful of not wanting um, to create any inherent bias or inherent conflict of interest. I apologize for the background noise. It's New York City. Um, you know, an inherent conflict of interest in the person to be able to, you know, uh, maybe accurately or inaccurately disclose their own sexual history at a time when the uh, MSM and gay community and LGBTQ community uh, really took up our prevention messaging in earnest, but also understanding the constraints of vaccine supply at the time and the need to um, expand eligibility in a methodical and deliberate way. So that balance has certainly been uh, one that we've tried to weigh carefully. And the result has been pretty dramatic. Next slide. This data is a few days out of date, but we've vaccinated a uh, we have given out a total of 107, almost 107,000 doses. Um, that's oh, it's actually uh, as of yesterday. So, so it is it is relatively up to date. Um, and that is a combination. The vast majority of those doses are first doses. As you will also know, New York City took a deliberate strategy to adopt a first dose only strategy for the bulk of our response to date. We've only opened up second doses in the last three to four weeks. And that was because we wanted to make a push to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And though extremely limited, the encouraging, clinic, the encouraging trial data and the encouraging uh, follow-up data that suggested that um, durable neutralizing titers were um, present up to two years after a single dose, that gave us in a time of emergency and in a time of extreme supply constraints at the time, um, this gave us a lot of encouragement to adopt the strategy. And I think it has paid off in terms of our overall um, slowing of the of transmission. Now that we have second doses in full flight, um, this represents a combination of first and second doses. But I believe about three quarters of these doses are first doses as reported here. Um, and we have seen, as in many jurisdictions, um, demand has slowed considerably. And so now we have the time to plan a more deliberate strategy as we extend eligibility, which I'll talk about later. Next slide. So these are our overall vaccination demographics. This is all publicly available data on our city health department website. As you can see, the majority of vaccines have gone to the borough of Manhattan. This is consistent with where the majority of the at-risk population lives. The majority of the LGBTQ, trans, um, and gay population live in Manhattan. The age demographics, again, consistent with the national trend, which is the bulk of vaccines going to um, at-risk people in the age group of 20, not 25 to 44. Um, we have begun additional outreach over the last month, in particular um, to um, LGBTQ senior centers and people who um, are above 65, above 55, who are expressing willingness to be vaccinated and, and um, who, might just, who might have high risk uh, behavioral uh, characteristics. Almost all of our vaccines, as, as expected, are, uh, have been administered to men and um, consistent with the demographics of the risk group as well, the vast majority have been, uh, the majority has been administered to Caucasian white New Yorkers. Um, and this data is a little bit out of date. I think it's about a week old. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about equity, which has been on everyone's mind and certainly a focus of ours. Next slide. As you can see here, the light purple bar is our 
overall population risk estimate. This is defined as men who have sex with men and transgender or gender non-conforming or non-binary people with two plus sexual partners in the past 12 months, which is a total of about 134, 135,000 people in New York City. That was our estimate at the time. Obviously, eligibility is evolving uh, as we move closer and closer towards a potential PrEP-like strategy. But this is where we are today, or this is where we are most recently. As you can see on most metrics, we are actually meeting the needs or close to meeting the needs of um, the at-risk population, whether by borough or by race and ethnicity. But there are some glaring, glaring gaps. Um, the African-American community has been uh, underserved in this regard. We have, we have struggled to engage them in vaccination. And the borough of the Bronx as well, which has at baseline um, less public health infrastructure and resources than other boroughs, we've also struggled to um, meet the at-risk population's needs and engage them into the vaccination campaign. Um, Staten Island also, for those of you who know New York well, Staten Island has also, as it, uh, as it did with COVID, these data represent or reflect very much what we saw during COVID. Um, Staten Island has been harder and harder to engage as well. We have a lot of work to do in this regard. We, we um, in many ways, the lessons are the same, but we haven't had the time necessarily coming out of COVID or coming out of the emergency phase of COVID and then being hit successively with, with this uh, outbreak as well, uh, more recently with polio, the time to really build a deliberate uh, and timely equity strategies into our vaccine delivery uh, system. But we have done a lot for this effort and in this effort. I will say honestly that we need to have a real conversation as a country about the trade-offs between speed and equity. Speed and equity are always in tension, and we have to be honest about that. In the COVID experience, our health department data suggested through our community partners that it took anywhere from five to 10 individual conversations to move someone from the African-American community in a high-risk neighborhood, at-risk neighborhood, um, from no to yes to get the COVID vaccine. One community partner reported 16 to one ratio of conversation to movement from no to yes. And so it should be no surprise that communities that have been underserved, marginalized, misserved for so long have built up a, 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 a body of mistrust in um, government. And we have to be brave enough to acknowledge that and also say we are going to build in deliberate strategies from the beginning to address those inequities, however long it takes. But understanding that our strategies that emphasize speed are always in tension with equity-focused strategies, especially as it relates to the specific needs of the African-American community here in New York City. Next slide. So what are core strategies, the core pillars of our equity approach has been, number one, to reduce barriers to vaccination. Number two, engage deeply and regularly in community and stakeholder buy-in and feedback. Number three, partnerships with community-based organizations. Um, and number four, event-based outreach. So I'll take you through a little bit of what we've done. Next slide. In reducing barriers to vaccination, we began by offering appointments outside of traditional business hours. One of the big, one of the early critiques was that it was hard for people to get off work and to go get vaccinated. Um, so we opened up appointments on evenings and weekends. In the initial phase of the outbreak, when vaccine supply nationally was extraordinarily limited, we reserved appointments for priority groups despite that limited supply. That is by zip code and using zip codes that track with our at-risk population, as well as populations that have been hardest hit by COVID and that have the worst underlying health statistics, um, we restricted appointments by zip code. We reserve vaccination appointments for community-based organizations. So these are not appointments that ever reach the public, but that were given directly to our network of community-based organizations through 55 organizations across all five boroughs so that they could engage directly their clients um, and their patients 
to make direct appointments with our uh, city-run vaccination clinics. We um, emphasized vaccination through trusted community providers. So we gave vaccine to community clinical providers. Um, some examples like Cal and Lord um, here in New York City, uh, a large FQHC network that serves the LGBTQ community. They've been a trusted partner of ours in actually delivering um, vaccine. And lastly, by direct booking by community engagement staff at outreach events. So allowing people to do education and outreach and then make an appointment on site has been extraordinarily helpful in reducing barriers to vaccination. Next slide. In addition, we opened up new vaccination sites in geographic areas with gaps that have been, that were identified early in the vaccination rollout. We built and deployed mobile vaccination vans in partnership with our public hospital system. And we expanded to take walk-ins as soon as we saw demand beginning to soften and capacity allowed. Next slide. In terms of our community partnerships, we leveraged long-standing relationships with community organizations and providers serving populations at highest risk for monkeypox. Um, that is built on years, if not decades of work around HIV, um, much of it by Dr. Daskalakis, who is now at the White House, um, to build up a network of trusted providers, trusted advocates, trusted institutions that we could lean into, whether it was for vaccination specifically, but also for dissemination of messaging, community engagement, uh, organizing of town halls and, and dialogue. We've been in extraordinarily close dialogue with the community, and it's really built on those networks of community organizations. Um, could we convene regular meetings uh, weekly at a minimum, often two or three times a week, to seek stakeholder feedback on new developments and on policy changes in real time, because there were certainly a few that were happening really quickly. Next slide. We contracted with 29 CDOs, community-based organizations, to deploy proactive outreach and engagement in communities at most risk uh, of infection, uh, with a focus on really a whole of community approach. What do we mean when we say a whole of community approach? We mean really leaning into um, our partnership, which we call the Monkeypox Awareness and Prevention Partnership, um, which, is, which is to lean into organizations that have credible messengers, that are culturally and linguistically responsive, that are providing um, not only broad-based messaging, but really tailored and appropriate messaging for people who are often left behind with one-size-fits-all approaches. This partnership really ensures that, and this whole of community approach really ensures that we're not leaving people behind. Even if we're putting out the best messaging in a number of languages, there are still people who are left behind because we're not reaching them, we're not bringing information and access and resources to them. And this whole of community approach holds us accountable to that. We need to take a one-size-fits-all approach as well as a tailored approach, and, and it's really a both and. Um, our CBO outreach efforts also lean heavily on credible messengers and on the community partnerships we built during COVID, especially targeting um, BIPOC communities that were hit hardest during COVID and the zip codes that were most impacted by COVID, we're seeing the same inequities in vaccine access for monkeypox. And so we leaned, we began to lean on our community-based partnerships in those zip codes in order to bring LGBTQ and MSM and gay people of color into our vaccination campaign. And we've seen some benefit. Um, we've also really deferred a lot of the messaging to the CBOs themselves, really to let them raise awareness about prevention, testing, and care options, and connection to vaccination. It's not always appropriate for me to be, or anyone from our government, to be the face of communication around this. And we've learned that over years, and really, the, and we've learned that especially during COVID, that people want to hear from the people in their community that are always around. Next slide. We've done significant event-based outreach, trying to meet communities where they are, distribute educational materials, which we started back in early June uh, during Pride, um, reaching circuit parties, sex parties, uh, bars, Vogue balls, and community health fairs and events. We started with information, and then as vaccine appeared, as testing resources appeared, began connecting them with services, and even pre-positioning mobile resources on site 
at these events. Next slide. We've participated in over 450 events since June 2022, and I have to really thank my community engagement team who have been everywhere and anywhere that we're asked to go. We've engaged with over 27,000 people addressing their questions and offering additional information. And we've scheduled um, 326 MPV vaccine appointments during this outreach. So it, you know, the numbers are uh, large, but they're also, it's about really tailoring an approach to um, the social and sexual networks that are actually at the highest risk of transmission. And so going to where people are um, was, was really crucial. Next slide. So what are the lessons we've learned in this effort? Um, clearly, clearly, there's immense value in leveraging existing community relationships. We at the health department and city government, we need to show ourselves to be consistently open to receiving feedback, humble enough to accept criticism when we are deserving of it, and open enough to say, here's what we've done right, here's what we've done wrong, here's how we're gonna fix it. That has gone a really long way to building trust. We had some technical glitches at the beginning rollout of our uh, vaccination effort. And the best thing I did was to get on TV and say, I'm sorry. And it's not something we often say in government, but I think it's something we could all learn from as we think about our own, the own humility with which we need to bring to this work as complex and as challenging as it is. If we're not able to look people in the eye, affected people and say, you know, we didn't get that right, I'm sorry what are we doing here, right? What are we really doing here? We need to be focused on serving them in a way that recognizes that we're humans, we don't always get it right. That goes a long way to getting them back engaged and building a stronger trusting dialogue. I mentioned the tension between speed and equity. We have to name it, we have to recognize it, and we also have to build in an equity infrastructure that allows us to plan with equity in mind from the beginning of a response. That means mapping community organizations, where they work, on what issues they work, with what populations they work, and what are their basic assets. Some of the organizations we work with have five people. Some of them have 500 people, and they all have very different capacities to do work. We as a government need to be mapping and understanding what are our assets in terms of delivering on equity, and how do we partner with them, provide them with financial resources, technical resources, data resources, and then, of course, the accountability to say, you're going to be a key pillar of us reaching our population health goals, in this case, our vaccination targets. The transition to intradermal dosing was challenging. It was an enormous opportunity, a great opportunity to expand supply, and in no small part is a reason why we're not facing supply constraints today, and why we have seen everyone be able to make the second dose appointments they need. And we're talking about expanding eligibility beyond the narrow 14 day window towards more of a uh, prep strategy. So that's an extraordinary thing. And folks should be commended for being innovative and in making that change. But make no mistake, for us in the local context, on the ground every day, these are non-trivial changes. They, they don't get absorbed quickly. It is extraordinarily hard to make midstream course corrections, especially at a moment when you're trying to build up trust, a bank of trust. The populations that were slower to get vaccinated or that we were slower to reach are the same ones asking us the question, why am I getting a different version of, or the same vaccine delivered in a different way? And the process of building back the trust to convince them and to reassure them that scientifically this is the same, efficacy is the same, this is a good thing, that takes time, that takes real engagement and humility. And I think when we make these decisions at any level of government, we have to be thinking about how is this going to work on the ground. Um, and of course, it's critical to address the weaknesses identified in the COVID-19 rollout and to really build those lessons back in. And I mentioned equity infrastructure as a key piece of this. It's something we're really working on here in New York we have to define a predictable set of community assets and partners that we can lean on always, not just in times of emergency, but lean on in our health planning 
uh, more predictably so that we can activate them when we need them in times of urgency or emergency. Next slide. So our ongoing strategies are to, of course, maintain balance between expanding eligibility and reaching those at highest risk. Um, we continue to learn more about the gaps in vaccine access that we're seeing and certainly in vaccine confidence in order to better meet community needs through targeted approaches. Of course, um, the part that we have all learned during COVID is that um, people's willingness to get vaccinated um, and their readiness to get vaccinated is often proportional or highly correlated with their sense of risk, their sense of individual risk, as well as the community sense of risk. And in an environment of steeply falling cases, we have to work hard to combat the perception um, that monkeypox is no longer a threat and that it is a good idea to get vaccinated. That is, it was much easier to push people to do that when monkeypox was, was on the incline, as, as cases were on the incline. Um, and of course, shifting our vaccine delivery towards mobile outreach, pop-up, and routine health system delivery. So much of our vaccine success, vaccination success in New York has, was built on health department, government assets, standing up mass vaccination sites, pre-positioning vaccine in all five boroughs to, in a high throughput manner. Um, we can't do that for long. Uh, we don't have emergency resources to fund it. And we need to lean on our health care systems, our routine health care delivery systems, to deliver on the long-term goals of getting as many at-risk people uh, vaccinated for monkeypox as possible. And that comes with its challenges in terms of payment, reimbursement, access, um, coverage for the uninsured or underinsured. So these are all things we're wrestling with now. Next slide. I just want to end by thanking everyone on my team, all of our incident command structure emergency response groups here listed here, our health department monkey box advisory committee, which is comprised of local and national um, LGBTQ and MSM leaders in public health, in human rights, in law, from a whole range of disciplines. Our advocates, our community leaders in New York City, we could not have done this without you. You know, a major thanks to you. And really, we feel like we're in partnership with you. And thank you to everyone at the Department of Health and Human Services for your partnership, for your, your open lines of communication, and you know, obviously for making all of these resources and tools available to us in our local jurisdictions so we can deliver for the American people and for New Yorkers. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vassan. And I wanna thank all the members of our uh, panel. We have time for a couple of questions from uh, those either in the room or online. Rob Schechter, you move fast. Thank you, and, and thanks very much to the panel. I wanted to express uh, appreciation as well for to uh, FDA, CDC, ASPR, uh, BARDA for all the um, efforts that led to accessibility and, and the uh, making maximizing the scarce supply for to respond to the outbreak. Um, I did want to express one or two concerns. One is um, I think there was a concern at the state and local levels about well-oiled systems being in place over the last few years to order and distribute vaccines um, that uh, that were not initially utilized or uh, have not been utilized to some degree um, and given the uh, demands and the urgencies of the, of the response. So a couple of questions is to what degree do you foresee the the separate ASPR HPOP system and the VTRAX or based uh, system for that's been used for hundreds of millions of doses of COVID, to what degree do you see further convergence or merging of those two systems? And again, in expressing appreciation to ASPR for, for listening so carefully, uh, leading to the distribution contract, but um, to what degree do you see further convergence? And then uh, a second question um, would be, if monkeypox should become endemic, um, if after the response we're, we're still trying to immunize at-risk populations for an endemic disease over over the long run, um, how will the system change to to accommodate that? Thank you. Well, this is Steve. I'd be happy to jump in and then welcome uh, assistance from other colleagues. Um, there, there are actually quite a number of things wrapped up in the questions just raised. 
Uh, I will say that um, in terms of historic plans and means for uh, carrying out distribution for the specific tools in question for the Genios, uh, for other smallpox tools for 20 years, the national plans uh, involve moving product uh, at a, essentially a bulk level to state and large city jurisdictions that would stand up ad hoc distribution measures. Now, having said that, I would say that smallpox scenario was predicated on a presumption of a full national mobilization and uh, at all levels, in fact, of city, state, local government, um, the, the non-governmental, you know, that everyone would be together trying to carry out distribution to prevent a great loss of life and a, and a terrible smallpox calamity. Clearly, and thankfully, that's not what was presented by monkeypox, but the more recent experience of uh, COVID vaccine distribution that I think worked quite well, um, there were also a number of, uh, frankly, bureaucratic limitations, uh, some of them there for good reasons, but the funding that supported um, the, the COVID response and the specific contracts in place for distribution of vaccine for COVID actually could not be used to support a monkeypox response, um, a number of appropriations issues, and also um, contracts that have been put in place in 2020 under an emergency um, uh, flag uh, to support the, the rapid creation of a distribution capability uh, for COVID that simply couldn't be extended further legally. So th these are bureaucratic answers that, that you know satisfy no one, but they're the truth. I think moving ahead, our planning assumption is that we will need to create long-term additional distribution capability um, to address unknown scenarios and work closely with our state and local colleagues as we move ahead in what is hopefully a, a post-COVID world to, to better understand how the uh, historic planning around some of the large Suburni events like smallpox or anthrax um, what assumptions there are still valid and what new tools could be brought to bear. Um, uh, and I think we'll be spending certainly the, the next year or so working with jurisdictions to try to understand what has changed, what can't be changed, um, and what the future looks like with that. I think it's an open question as to uh, how we look at vaccine availability if monkeypox becomes endemic. And I know there's been a, a lot of discussion around uh, potential future commercialization of vaccine access, um, but I believe those are really open questions at this point. So I'll pause and see if other colleagues, um, Dr. Carter or others, uh, care, to, uh, care to jump in. Thanks, Steve. I think you did a great job. Responding to that question, I'll just make a quick comment about the HPOP uh, VTRAX question. Uh, we certainly have heard uh, and, and greatly appreciate the feedback from the jurisdictions on how difficult that process has made inventory reporting wastage uh, and taking a system that um, uh, much time, money, and expertise had gone into developing and we were not able to use it for monkeypox distribution. I think as Steve was describing, because the uh, this MCM was part of the strategic national stockpile, uh, we were just dependent on using their system, and lots of you know time uh, sensitivities to get something up and running and get vaccine out into the the states. At this point, though, there has been you know a lot of time and discussion looking at the 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 infrastructure and the details and hardware software issues with HPOP and VTREX. So we are um, planning that uh, those issues that uh, plagued us during monkeypox rollout will not be the same issues that face us should we need to uh, engage with other medical countermeasures in the future. So a lot of active work happening to, uh, to fix that problem for the future. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, not much we can do at it at this point, so appreciate everyone's patience with this. Our next question is from John Douglas online. Uh, 
Yes, thank you, Dr. Hopkins. That was really a fantastic panel. Thanks to all three of the presenters. I had two questions for Dr. Vassan. Um, your, your decline in cases are very gratifying. You guys have really had an enormously broad response. Do you see any differential shapes of your epi curve by race, ethnicity, or by your boroughs? For example, given your variable vaccine uptake. Yeah, it's a great question, John. Um, similar to COVID, we do see um, slower rates of decline. The overall curve is obviously declining, but the rate of decline is slower in the outer boroughs. Um, and the rate of vaccination uptake is obviously slower in the outer boroughs. Um, and thinking about the outer boroughs as well, it correlates race and place are so tightly correlated in New York City that it's impossible to also not see those trends in race-based demographics as well. We've also seen testing obviously um, also have these same baked in inequities. So we're also not necessarily case finding uh, everyone we need to um, in terms of the black and brown communities in New York City. So really we have an engagement issue, whether it's for preventive services like vaccination or even diagnostic and testing and treatment. We, we have some interesting data that we will be putting out soon around treatments, which I think um, are actually more um, encouraging with respect to our inequities. And it, it does make me wonder whether there's just some innate um, bias built in around uh, completion of the conversion from testing positive to treatment for people who are symptomatic and in need of help versus engaging in, in a preventive intervention like a vaccination. Um, and if I could ask you one more thing, I thought your metric about, I don't know quite how you described it, number of conversations per vaccine given being higher in some of your less trusting communities. It's, it's a concept I haven't heard of before, but I think it's got enormous equity implications, both in terms of planning as well as measuring what's happening. How, how do you guys actually measure that? Do you, do you have actually ways of tabulating conversations before you actually get a vaccine given? Yeah, we track all of our community. We, we during COVID um, and when we built, we built a program called Public Health Core, which is a network of around 100 community-based organizations in the around 50 odd zip codes that were most uh, affected by the early waves of COVID-19. Um, and so um, in those zip codes, we have a network of community-based organizations and we provided those organizations with additional staffing and resources so they could engage in uh, PPE distribution, testing uptake, and then later on vaccine distribution. And as a part of our vaccine engagement, and we brought we started vaccine engagement, as you know, months before we actually had the vaccines in hand. And we really tracked um, both preceding conversations to the point where we had supply, as well as new conversations after we had supply um, and to the point of getting someone vaccinated. And so, yeah, we've tracked at an individual level, we've tracked the number of conversations on average, um, and we can measure them on average. Um, in terms of conversion rate. And I think we have to start talking very openly and publicly about this tension between speed and equity, because if we don't, we will repeat the same challenge. We will have the same challenges and maybe repeat the same mistakes um, that we've made in the past. So we'll be eager to talk more about that. Thank you. I want to once again thank the members of our panel on uh, monkeypox supply uh, and uh, appreciate your efforts and keep working forward. Uh, we have ongoing challenges. Our next uh, and our final panel for the morning will be experiences in the field, avia avian flu monitoring. Our presenter will be Dr. Matthew Silt, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. He's a senior staff veterinarian from USDA talking about avian influenza control strategies. Dr. Silt, you are, have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I work for the Center for Veterinary Biologics and I'm a reviewer and I license veterinary biologics and some of these biologics that we do license are avian influenza vaccines. So I'd like to talk a little bit today about the different control, control strategies that we use for avian influenza and these might be different than what 
are used for other animal species and certainly different from what's used in the human side. So next slide. So avian influenza are type A influenza, orthomyxoidae, viridae family. They're the same as, as human and swine or, you know, type A influenza viruses. They're eight single-stranded uh, negative sense uh, viral part uh, viral pieces. That, and when we do have co-infection of a bird with various diff different types of avian influenza viruses, we can get reassortment. And then when that happens, we can get these these devastating viruses that can potentially cause very bad effects for the poultry industry. And so avian influenza viruses are a little bit unique in that we have different types of virulence that are available. So we have a low pathogenic virus and we also have a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. So the low pathogenic avian influenza viruses are the hemagglutinin and you know, subtypes one through 16. Those are all can be low pathogenic in general cause, mild morbidity, um, weight, uh, egg production, mild diarrhea, things like that, but they generally don't cause death in the animals. And the highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses are, are mainly, um, lumped in with the H5 and H7 subtypes. And these are devastating viruses for poultry, high morbidity, high mortality, and as we'll talk about, have devastating effects for the poultry industry worldwide. When I say poultry, I mean uh, turkeys and chickens. So, and birds are, are natively uh, naive to these viruses. So when they are infected, they, it, they tend to um, cause pretty severe infections. So from the HPA AI perspective, so next slide. So we've had a few outbreaks in the United States recently. We've had um, quite a few throughout the world, but the United States has been fairly refractory from highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks. And in 2014, 2015, we had a nationwide outbreak where highly pathogenic avian influenza was introduced to the United States. It started as H5N1, um, then circulated as H5N8, and then eventually as the H5N2. And this is our largest loss um, so far in birds. Over 50 million birds were depopulated or infected and died from the infection. So that was in 2014, 2015. It caught us by gar uh, off guard there and was pretty devastating for the poultry industry. In 2016, 2017, we had different kinds of introductions of, of highly pathogenic avian influenza. These were smaller, these were viruses that circulated as a low pathogenic uh, uh, phenotype and then converted to a highly pathogenic, got into poultry. We were able to control those fairly quickly and those stopped. Um, they, were, they were very localized disease. And just recently in this last December and this whole year, we've had another a nationwide outbreak and it's actually widespread across um, uh, North America. And we have uh, an H5N1 virus, highly pathogenic H5N1 that's circulating. And this is ongoing to this day. And click on the next slide, please. This shows you that this demonstrates how widespread the virus is here. So the uh, we've had about 45.1 million birds affected as of yesterday or two days ago. Uh, the red dots represent commercial poultry. The green dots are, are wild birds. The yellow dots on there are com non-commercial backyard poultry. Um, and so we can see that wild, wild birds are... Are, are, there's been a lot of detection of this virus in wild birds out there in the United States as well as Canada. So what's unique about this, this, this clade 2344B H5N1 is that it affects wild birds, it's staying in wild, wild birds, it's killing them, but it's also circulating widely. And we see a large, a large amount of the poultry in the upper Midwest here that have been affected. But again, we, we're, we've had recent uh, outbreaks just in the last few days um, in the Midwest, uh, uh, Ohio, as well as out west in California, Utah. So it, it continues to uh, be an ongoing um, uh, outbreak that we are, we are trying to control. Next slide, please. So we control avian influenza a little bit differently than how we control it for in other species. So first thing is we 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 try and impose a very strict biosecurity, um, a quarantine uh, process, and have biosecurity where we limit the introduction of avian influenza into 
uh, uh, poultry flocks. We do quite a bit of surveillance out there to see what's circulating in the wild birds out there. Um, again, these viruses, low path and high path viruses circulate in wild birds, shorebirds, et cetera. And so we, we often will, will look and see what's out there. Uh, uh, for control strategies, we have vaccination and depopulation. So vaccination has been used um, outside the United States and outside North America, and it's been able to control five of the 36 HPAI epizootics from 1959 to 2015. Uh, depopulation, however, though, is the main strategy that's used worldwide, and it's been used to control 31 out of the 36 epizootics. So it's been a, it's, it's been a mixed um, uh, control policy out there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about depopulation now. So next slide. So in the United States, we use depopulation to essentially euthanize or, or rapidly euthanize a high density poultry houses. So this picture here kind of gives you an example of how why, how large a poultry house could be here. And this is a, a foam-based asphyxiation um, uh, apparatus here that dispenses a, a foam-based, a, a water-based foam out there that causes asphyxiation of poultry that are on the floor. So this works nicely for floor poultry. You can have over 100,000 broiler or meat-producing chickens inside a, 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 a production house. Euthanizing these birds um, individually is not an ex is not something that's possible to do. So we have to use more mass um, euthanasia techniques. The other technique that's possible is uh, whole house gassing. Um, this is where you uh, seal the house and then you um, use carbon dioxide. Um, and that carbon dioxide gas essentially produces asphyxiation similar to what the, happens with the water-based foam. This also works for layers or, or, or chickens that are, that are laying eggs and that are up in cages that are not on the floor. And last but not least, we also have uh, ventilation shut down. And this is something that's not really used that much anymore, but basically they shut down the ventilation and then the birds um, succumb from hyperthermia or high, high body temperature there. So next slide. So we also, uh, vaccination is, is, a, is a possibility. We don't currently use vaccines to control highly pathogenic avian influenza in the United States, but we do license these biologics um, with the possibility that they could be used. And we also do license them to be exported to other countries that do use uh, vaccines to control avian influenza. So this, these are some of the general requirements that we use at CVB when we license a vaccine such as avian influenza. So we consider the master seed that's being used here, and we will consider the use of a, of a whole virus as long as it's killed. It cannot be a whole virus that is, is live or that's a, a general attenuated live virus because that live virus could be uh, revert to virulence or reassort, as I talked about earlier. So we will use a whole killed product. We will use vectored products. So we can sometimes take the hemagglutinin gene from a, a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus and put that into foul pox or uh, a, terp, uh, a herpes virus of, of poultry and then use that as a vector to then infect and express that antigen. And again, we also will uh, we all also will consider things like subunit vaccines, um, DNA vaccines, subunit protein, et cetera, as possible um, master seeds for these. We, these are fully licensed products. We will not consider the use of autogenous products or prescription for avian influenza control. Um, similar to other vaccines that we license, if it's a killed product, we, we um, require a firm that they perform an activation study to demonstrate that the killed product is fully inactivated. So we're not using, we're not releasing a live virus into poultry by the vaccine. Um, potency wise, we, we expect the, the firm to be able to demonstrate that this product is potent there. So for a killed product, we will do a a vaccination challenge study. And for vectored products, we will look for the insert um, ratio of insert expression compared to the vector itself. 
Uh, for efficacy studies, we, we expect that for all products that have a claim to protect against avian, high, highly pathogenic avian influenza, that those will be done in a high containment facility, a BSL-3 ag facility. So that's one of the limitations we put on the efficacy studies out there. Pre-licensing cereals, the, the firm must submit pre-licensing cereals for batching consistency as well as potency to confirm for our laboratory to confirm that they are adequate. Uh, field safety studies are also performed to make sure that the product is safe to use and the target animal species in large numbers. And then we do have certain license restrictions that I'll talk about in a second. But because these vaccines in the United States are used to control uh, a disease, um, they do have certain restrictions that we put on them that they're to be used under the supervision of, of APHIS uh, Veterinary Services. And if you're interested in more information about the uniqueness of avian influenza vaccines for veterinary use uh, and how we license them, we have a, a specific veterinary services mem memorandum 800.685 that can be viewed publicly to um, see what we, how we uh, evaluate these. Next slide. So we have some regulatory authority, um, the, or we have some documents that explain the different regulatory authority that we we place on even influenza vaccines. And the first one is the Veterinary Services Guidance 8605.1, and this allows the use of H5 and H7 vaccines to be as a control for highly pathogenic influenza in poultry. And then it lists the, uh, it, it, it sub-references the Veterinary Services Memorandum 885, which has the licensing requirements. The 9 CFR 102.5 is, is, does place a restriction on the use of some vaccines to control disease in domestic animals and to also to promote public health. So we do place a restriction on this vaccine that it cannot be released it cannot be released without specific uh, um, conditions being met there. And talking about some of the license restrictions that we place that we that are on these products for avian influenza, um, in 800.85, it talks about the distribution um, of avian influenza vaccines to each state will be limited to only be authorized by specific recipients in, uh, in each state and the officials there. And this vaccine can only be used under the supervision of APHIS Veterinary Services as part of the official control program. So you cannot, we cannot release these vaccines to veterinarians to prophylactically vaccinate in the absence of an outbreak. So we have restrictions that we place that it can only, only be used for a disease control program. So next slide. So when we think about vaccinating birds for, for our highly pathogenic avian influenza. Obviously, we want to uh, accomplish several things here. And so a safe, efficacious um, vaccine should closely match the circulating strain out there that's in the field. And if this is an effective vaccine, it's going to um, increase the amount of virus to infect these vaccinated birds. It's going to greatly increase that uh, amount of virus that's going to be required there. And it's also going to reduce shedding and spread of the virus. So if a vaccine is efficacious, it should, it should have those qualities to that. Um, we generally don't feel, APHIS does not feel that vaccination by itself can control or control a highly pathogenic avian influenza alone. So that's why we generally do not use that as a control strategy in the United States. Vaccination, however, could be used in conjunction with other uh, other techniques such as depopulation to control highly, pathog a highly pathogenic avian influenza. And this is what's used a lot around the world. Next slide. So this is a theoretical um, uh, figure about how we would use the combination of vaccination as well as depopulation together. So in the center is an infected premises. So this is an infected poultry farm with lots of birds. The blue area is the buffer zone where we restrict access in, in and outside that zone there. So we don't move any, um, we, we try to limit the amount of fomite or, or transmission of virus from inside that infected zone to, to poultry that are not infected yet there. And then in the yellow, we have this protection vaccination zone, or it can be also be thought of as the, the containment vaccination zone. This is a ring around the infected premises, and we can vaccinate poultry 
in this zone here. So sometimes we also have additional valuable birds or animals that are, are, are you know, extinct or in danger, or going extinct, endangered, et cetera, that are, that are highly viable, that also could be susceptible to the disease and we vaccinate them in that zone there too. And so, and then we watch and, and make sure that the virus is not spreading beyond that, uh, that, that vaccination or containment zone there. So, so we use, this is a theoretical strategy. We don't do this in the United States. Currently we are only depopulating, but if we were authorized by by APHIS uh, and the and veterinary services to use vaccination, this is a strategy that we might use to um, control. Next slide. So again, vaccinations might be, might be a beneficial strategy to use um, uh, to control HPI, but it does limit our trade restrictions. So uh, if we are vaccinating, we are going to have difficulties in, in exporting our, our poultry products worldwide there. So, um, and that's because sometimes you can't differentiate whether or not a bird is, is positive from the vaccine or if it's positive from the infection. So you can't differentiate an infected from a vaccinated animal, and that does limit your ability to, um, ex you know, to for trade. So that's a, that's a big economic consequence of vaccination out there. Um, vaccination, again, uh, may mask clinical disease and make it harder for uh, diagnosis and identification of the virus, so allowing the virus to spread kind of silently, if you will, across populations of vaccinated poultry. So it could be, it could be more difficult for us to actually identify and, and, and stop a, 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 an outbreak. And also the high cost of vaccination. So it's it's expensive financially and logistically. Again, vaccinating 100,000 birds in a house is is not very feasible. So we do have unique ways in poultry that we can mass vaccinate, and we do employ this strategy for some vaccines that can be administered to the egg before they hatch. So we use a novo vaccination as one strategy. We can place them in the water for some vaccines. So the, the poultry drink them or are exposed to the vaccine, uh, but these have to be live vaccines, obviously. And lastly, we can, we can walk through a house, a poultry house and, and spray them coarsely with a, uh, with a, with a spray um, formulation of a, vac of a live vaccine, which then can be administered to a large population of birds. So, so the large numbers of, of poultry in, that we have in the United States and the large number of poultry that are densely packed into these houses are, think, are factors that we have to consider um, when we want to use vaccination. So that's all I had today talking about avian influenza, and I would gladly entertain any questions. Thank you, Dr. Silt. Are there any uh, questions or comments from those uh, on the committee? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Silt. We appreciate your presentation. I don't see any uh, questions or comments at this time. Uh, we will now go to uh, adjourn for lunch. Uh, it is now uh, 1245, we will return and start our next panel at 1.30. Thank you all for your attendance to the September 22nd, uh, first day of our National Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.